much. Uh, it's very nice uh, to be here, and I think that this uh, workshop is a very good initiative that we in academia and um, industry should probably collaborate more. So I'm going to talk today about my main research interests, which uh, concerns how air pollution may affect um, different um, um, health uh, outcomes related to brain health. And I should start by saying that what, what I do is um, has mainly been related to outdoor air pollution. So it's very nice to hear and learn more about indoor air pollution here today. <coughs> so but I would like to start with showing this slide. Um, I think we'll all, we'll, we're, we're all in this room aware of that air pollution is a major cause of morbidity and mor mortality worldwide. And as Anita also showed you, these numbers are based on basically three different groups of, of uh, health outcomes. It's respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and also some cancers related to the respiratory organs. And of course, uh, mortality also, um, natural cause mortality. But what I think is interesting with respect to what I'm going to talk uh, about today is that um, um, if uh, um, there are associations between air pollution and other health outcomes related to the brain, such as mental health or dementia, uh, uh, these numbers um, are of course very much underestimated. So um, this is a quite new research area. There are much more studies on air pollution in association with respiratory health or cardiovascular health, and that's why um, neurological health effects aren't included in the global burden of disease estimates for air pollution. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about what we know about air pollution in association with cognitive development in children what we know about air pollution in association with cognitive decline and dementia in the elderly, and also a little bit about what we know about air pollution and mental health. So as I said, this is a quite new research area. This was a search I did yesterday on PubMed, where all scientific papers related to medicine are supposed to be collected. So here you can see the number of hits for the search air pollution cognitive function from 1945, I think, up to this year. And as you can see, it seems similar, as, or it looks like an exponential curve, right? And it's also interesting uh, that I think that from around 2010 or so, it's a much steeper increase. Uh, and that was when <coughs> some pioneering studies came out from um, Mexico City, where they had seen that children who lived in very uh, polluted areas of the city, uh, they had pathological changes in their brain that reminded a lot about Alzheimer, the changes you see in patients with Alzheimer. So these studies from Mexico City are still very much cited and I think was sort of the base of this new emerging research field as we see it growing now regarding air pollution and cognitive effects and air pollution and mental health effects. And it's also interesting to note the, uh, the scale here on the y-axis. If this was respiratory health um, papers, it you would probably have to multiply by a hundred or a thousand or so. So this is still a new, new research area, but very much increasing. <coughs> so I would just like to start by saying also that I'm working in observational epidemiology. That means that we observe an exposure in, in people and we see how their health develops over time. So we observe associations between exposures and health outcomes. But um, of course that is not enough to say that it's a causal association between an exposure and an outcome. Everything we do has to be based on experimental studies, at least according to my opinion. So I'm not going to talk about experimental studies behind this new research field, but I want you to know that there are a lot of experimental studies that support uh, uh, findings from observational epidemiology, <coughs> um, both in humans and in, in animals. Um, or not in humans, but in human tissues, and also in animals. So this is just, I'm just going to show this very quickly. This is what we sort of know or think 
that the mechanisms are um, for an association between air pollution and um, ner um, diseases related to the nervous system. It's from a very nice paper from 2012. Uh, and we don't, um, some of the mechanisms are very much the same as we see for respiratory health and cardiovascular disease, inflammation and oxidative stress. But interestingly also, we know, we think that some particles may travel directly, directly through the olfactory system to the brain. Um, but we don't know yet exactly what, what mechanisms are responsible for different um, diseases in, in the brain. But these are sort of an overview of the possible mechanistic pathways. So uh, I will start um, just mentioning um, sorry, uh, this is, uh, quite briefly what we know about air pollution and cognitive um, development in children. Uh, the guy on the picture <laughs> is a professor from Barcelona who is sort of um, uh, the main figure in this research field, I would say. He's a very nice and a brilliant researcher, and if you look him up, you can find um, lots of interviews he's, he has been doing where he, he's talking about this research field. I've just, I've just showed the first paper that came out from that research group, but there have been many others since then. That was that one. That one was in 2010, I think. Um, and what they saw there was that in Barcelona, they saw that children who lived in polluted areas had worse cognitive development than children who lived in in cleaner area or areas with cleaner air. And I think what I heard in the first presentation here today, when you talk about sleep and ventilation, that's very interesting related to this. So. Um, it may be that sleep is sort of mediating the effect they see here. Uh, but there are also studies on um, outdoor air pollution and, and sleep patterns, I think. <coughs> Not that many yet. But, um, so there are probably 10 or 20 studies in this um, research field at the moment. And um, most of them uh, are observing some kind of association. But what we still don't have is that we don't have any studies in low exposure areas. So um, Barcelona is quite a polluted city. We don't know if there would be an association between air pollution and cognitive development in Sweden, for example. So that still needs to be done. And for Swedish speakers, you can um, I provide a link here to a very nice uh, sh um, program, um, TV program where um, Jordi talks about his research, and there's a um, um, lot of nice interviews uh, about this um, research field. So, but moving on to dementia and cognitive <coughs> decline in the elderly, then. <coughs> I don't know if you see similar uh, headlines like this in your countries, but in Sweden we see it a lot because dementia is a disease uh, many people are very afraid of getting. So, um, and it's also increasing because we're living longer. Uh, and as you know, it has a huge societal and, in, and burden, on in, burden on the individuals and families. And <coughs> but what do we know about air pollution and uh, dementia and cognitive decline then? Well, um, uh, this is a very nice review that was done in 2016. There has been other studies since then. They identified 18 studies um, on air pollution and some cognitive um, related outcome in the elderly. And they observed that almost all of the studies um, saw some association between air pollution and at least one dementia related outcome. Um, and I'm just going to show you some results that we did, that our study was included in that review. Um, this is from a study that we did in Umeå, northern Sweden, uh, where there is a very nice cohort on aging that started in 1988. So they have followed people from 1988 and they have been tested every five years. So there's a lot of information on lifestyle and memory <coughs> testing and cognitive testing. And there's also sociodemographic data. So we combined that data, it was about 3,000 people, combine that with the modeled level of air pollution at the residential address of these people. 
And with air pollution, what the air pollution that we modeled <coughs> was uh, NO2 with the land use regression model. So it was an indicator for traffic related air pollution. So what we saw, I'm going to explain this table. Um, we divided the participants in four groups of exposure from lowest to highest, quartile one to quartile four. And then we calculated hazard ratios for dementia. So if the hazard ratio is one, it means that it's no increased risk. It can be interpreted like a relative risk. It's a, if it's a hazard ratio of 1.5, it means 50% increased risk. So what you can see is that in quartile three and four, the two highest exposure categories, the risk of getting dementia is around 40, 50% higher than in the lowest exposure groups. <coughs> and we, of course, took into account all other risk factors for dementia that uh, that's not that are known, um, but we didn't see anything affecting this association. It was very stable results. Um, and when we uh, we also did some calculations to see how much uh, the attributable fraction was. Uh, that means that um, how much of, of how how big proportion of the dementia cases could be attributed to air pollution exposure. And it was 16% in this study, which is quite high for an air pollution study. We also adjusted these results for noise <coughs> at, the, at the level at the addresses of the participants later on, but it did not affect the results. And <coughs> what we have also done later on is that we have added source-specific data. What we saw in the last slide was NO2, right? Traffic-related air pollution, marker of traffic-related air pollution. But what we later had was access to very um, high um, detailed data on uh, PM2.5 that was modeled in the area. And there are two major sources to PM2.5 in that area. It's wood burning and it's vehicle exhaust. So what you can see here is to the right estimates that reminds a lot about the previous the, uh, estimates from the previous slide. And they should do because it's the same source. You see increased risks in the two top uh, quartiles. But what you see in the mid column there, it's um, um, PM2.5 from wood burning. And there we see that there seemed to be an association with PM2.5 um, from wood burning and dementia as well. And this has not been published yet, so I, but I show you to it anyway. It's under revision. But it's quite interesting, I think, that the particles, when we talk about the toxicology component, components that particles from wood burning may be as harmful as particles from vehicle exhaust. So just moving on very quickly, it's a quick uh, presentation this. What do we know about air pollution and mental health? Well, even less than about air pollution and cognitive outcomes, I would say. But it's, this is also a very rapidly increasing uh, research area. What is most um, uh, established is probably that air pollution exposure during fetal life or first year of life can increase the risk of autism in children or in autism spectrum disorders. <coughs> there are quite a few studies on this, maybe 20 studies or so. Um, this was one of the first and best ones from California, <coughs> where they saw that uh, especially for the third trimester and the first year of life, these associations between autism and and the highest uh, exposure group. And there are also some other studies, I'm not going to go into detail, I don't have the time, but there are studies on schizophrenia, and that short-term elevations in air pollution can increase the suicide attempts and suicide completions, and that living in an area with a high level of air pollution can increase anxiety. So, but this is, there are very many studies coming. Um, so this is a study that we did in Sweden. We had 900,000 Swedish children and adolescents in four counties. Um, and we looked at the levels of exposure where they lived and their probability of dispensing medications for psychiatric disorders. It was a very broad group of psychiatric disorders. And we saw that in three out of four counties, we saw quite clear associations between, with both NO2 levels at there, um, where they live, and PM10 
they lived. And uh, yeah, so these are, so we want to, this is studies we want to continue um, and investigate in more detail what outcomes, uh, what mental health related outcomes would actually be responsible for the associations that we see. Yes? <laughs> Two more slides. <laughs> so, and I'm also just showing you very briefly a study that we did in Gothenburg where we looked at short term associations between air pollution and um, visits to the emergency de psychiatric emergency department. So what we saw very briefly was that if PM10 increases a few days, one or two days, we see an increase in the number of visits to the psychiatric emergency department, about three, three and a half percent per 10 microgram per cubic meter increase. We didn't see anything for NO2 and ozone though. Just my last slide. Um, this is a completely different study. This is not an epi, epidemiological study. This is a health impact assessment study. What we did here was that we estimated how would air pollution levels in Malmö city, it's a, um, to 20 kilometers from here, 300,000 people, uh, how would air pollution levels there, the NO2 levels, be affected if all vehicle tailpipe emissions were removed? So meaning that people switched from electric cars or active, active transport. And what we saw then was that, well, during one year we would save around 86 lives, which is about 10 times the number of people who die every year in traffic accidents. So that's just a reminder that air pollution is um, something we really need to think about and remember. So, thank you, that was very quick, I feel, but uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh,